Okay, uh, welcome everybody. I, I was resigned to the fact that each, each of these sessions would get lesser and lesser attendance because they're getting deeper and deeper. But this is a very good topic, I think, on, uh, on tech, so I'm excited to, uh, to give it. Um, and Jim Breen's not here to do the formal, uh, formal introduction, so I will just uh, introduce myself. I am Don Woodlock. Okay, let's go. Um, all right, let's do a reminder on what machine learning is. Anybody want to take a crack at what the essence of machine learning is from my prior comment, commentary? Lots of data and CPU cycles. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. That's what it needs, yes. So the idea on machine learning, if you think of a problem like um, predicting which patients will be readmitted in the next 30 days, uh, the old-fashioned way of solving this problem, if you were assigned this problem, is to ask doctors and nurses and discharge clerks and tell me about patients that get readmitted. Why do they get readmitted? What do they like? What do they, you know, what diseases do they have? That sort of thing. Uh, and then you codify whatever they say into a big program. So that's the old-fashioned way of doing it. And the new way of doing it is to not codify the subject matter expert, but just feed a more generic algorithm, a bunch of data about patients that have been readmitted, patients that haven't been readmitted, and these generic algorithms will sort of sift through the data and figure out what you might think of as a function of the features of patients and an output, whether they'll be readmitted or not. So it's more of a generic function, a generic code plus data uh, gives you this, um, this uh, translation. Okay, so that's, uh, that's machine learning. Uh, and then I just have a few bits on math. Uh, it's not as mathy as uh, prior ones. But again, you can think about it as a function. You have the features of whatever, features of a patient, or uh, I've done, uh, today I'll do features of a passenger on the Titanic, or features of a movie review. Um, and machine learning will figure out the function of those features into some output. Um, most of these cases, we're talking about a classification, like is this patient readmitted or not? Is this movie review positive or negative? Did a passenger survive or not survive on the Titanic? So that's classification. Uh, but you can also use it to um, uh, do uh, regressions or, or um, uh, a, a linear regression and such, like a, a, a value, like a price, price for a house or things like, things like that. Okay, uh, and the key is separation. So if you imagine like a two-feature situation uh, and you plot the different classes on your graph, if they're all intermingled, you don't have any chance of machine learning figuring out a separation, nor do you as a human. <laughs> but, um, but if they're in separate places in the space, of your graph, then you got a shot. And the um, building block of a lot of these machine learning algorithms is a line, so linear separation that separates the two classes. Even for a more complicated network, like uh, Aaliyah talked about last time, it's, it's a building up of different lines, essentially, that sort of are combined together to form maybe a different, more complicated separation. But a building block is really this linear equation, the weights, uh, a bunch of weights times each feature. Okay? So, um, what do equations need? Numbers. They need numbers. So, you can't feed text into this equation, right? So, that is the topic of today, which is how to take text turn it into numbers, and feed it through the same equations that I talked about the last two sessions. Okay? So let's just think about the equation just a little bit longer, and then we'll go into text. So um, we're going to go back to adults versus children, uh, just a two-feature system. Um, and here's your equation. Uh, and if this is very positive, you can assume it's an adult. And if it's negative, you can assume it's a child. So imagine that situation. And we have height and money in the bank. So um, could you tell adults from children from text data if you had it? Like if you knew the hair color, if you knew their shirt size, and if you saw their last correspondence. That correspondence might be 
an email. It might be a letter to Santa. It might be, um, you know, who knows, who knows what. Could you tell uh, the difference? Sure, sure. So you could do like a reading score from it and say, oh, if they're writing at a more complicated level, they're older. Mm -hmm. You could look for like what type of letter it is. Is mm -hmm. it a letter to Santa? Or yep, letter? yep, yep, yep. So you could certainly do it. So we just need a way to take textual data like this and get it into numbers. But the learning is just, it's, it's just as rich from a data source point of view. Uh, yeah, so if you, were, if you were given these, you could probably figure it out. Right? Kids don't have gray hair yet. I didn't have gray hair a few years ago. Um, uh, and you can tell the difference from writing samples, things like that. OK, so let's think about the equation a little bit more. So this, the machine learning algorithm is determining the weights. The x's get fed into this, uh, but it's the weights that this generic algorithm is trying to figure out. Now, what if this algorithm did a great job and one of the weights was very, um, was very positive. What would that mean? Yeah, that factor is discriminating. Actually, let me start with the lack of discrimination. So let's say it was zero. Okay? It did a great job playing with every weight it could think of, and it turned out zero was the best number to plug into that equation. What does that mean? Yeah, it's irrelevant. So that's an irrelevant piece of data. Uh, what if it's a very p a big positive number? So it's, dis it's relevant. So we've that. What else? It's relevant for adulthood. Yes, it's, it's uh, relevant for adulthood. So this x is something that the higher the x gets, the more adultish this instance is. OK? So, um, yeah, so an uh, example of that is height, money in the bank, things like, things like that. So what if, it's what if it's negative, if that weight ends up being a negative number? What does that mean? Yeah, the, feature, the, the higher that x gets, the more childish it is. So this might be, what would, be, what would it be in this case? Yeah, crayon, uh, <laughs> use of cr number of crayons used in the last writing sample. You know, number of baby teeth. I don't know, number of play dates. Um, you know, things like that. It'd be th th those kinds of things um, would be would be it. Number of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches eaten this week. Things you know. Yeah, it could mean a parent and. Um, my, uh, one of my jobs, I eat peanut butter and jelly every day, uh, actually. When, when I left, my team gave me a 40-gallon tub of peanut butter, uh, actually, as a, as a gift. And I did calculate how long it would take me to eat the whole thing and whether it would still be good. And it didn't turn out it was going to be good. So I gave it to a food bank, as it turns out. OK. All right, so an example of uh, irrelevant numbers would be maybe your street address. Right or the number of you know the number of letters in your first name or what else did I put? Yeah, number of people in your house or meal or things like that. So you may chunk in irrelevant things, and actually these machine learning algorithms do an okay job of like weighting them down to zero. Okay, so back to text. The, the, um, I'm going to give you the answer in advance. We're going to turn the text into numbers. And we need to do it in a way that the higher the number, the more correlated it is to one of the classes. OK, so I'll get back to this concept as we go, uh, as we go through it. But you, wanna, you want a feature, you want an x that's sort of correlated with the class, so more adultish or more childish as the number goes, goes up in this, uh, in this case. OK, so we'll see how that, uh, that ends up working. OK. Um, I have these three columns, which you could call text, let's say, and they're actually three different kinds of text. Anyone want to take a guess at differentiating these? Patrick? Yeah, you got two columns that are enumerated. Yeah, yeah. So there's kind of a finite number of, of um, answers. 
for these two, and this one is sort of wide open text, let's say. Okay? And one of them the enumerated values have a natural sequence, the other they don't. Very good. So the difference between this column and this column is this column, even though it's written as text, has a natural order to it. Right? Small, medium, large, extra large. Okay? Versus the hair color, which doesn't have a natural order to it. Okay? So these are called uh, category fields. Uh, and this is called an ordinal category because it has an order. Uh, and this is a nominal category. Okay? And those get treated differently. We'll, we'll see in a, in, a, in a moment. And this is just free-form text. So this is a little bit different. So I'm going to take you through these three things. The first two we're going to do with the Titanic data set, and the third one we're going to do with the movie reviews. And then we will close. Okay. Oh, and then I'm going to show you one other thing, actually. OK. Um, I'm going to jump over to my notebook. Should I make the text bigger? Yes. How do you do that in Chrome? That didn't work. How about on a Mac? There we go. Does that look OK? Bigger? OK. OK, so let me show you the Titanic data set. This is a, um, I hope none of your relatives that died in the Titanic, or this would be a little bit of a downer. Um, but this is a uh, data set of passengers in the Titanic. Uh, the class is whether they survived or not. So this is sometimes called the label. Uh, and then the rest of the fields are, uh, there's about nine of them. Uh, name, sex, age, number of siblings or spouses, a number of parents or children, uh, your ticket number, what you paid, your cabin number, if available, uh, the th city you embarked from. I forget the names of the cities, but there's three of them, S, C, and Q, uh, and your class, your passenger class. Make sense? Those, um, the numbers of siblings, spouses, and parents, were those on the boat or just in general? On the boat, on the Titanic with you. OK? You already trying to work it out? <laughs> okay. All right, so question number one. Uh, what, what are the numeric features? So we'll start there with the numeric features. What are the numeric features that you think will be correlated to the label? Age. Any others? Possibly the ticket. Fair. Mm -hmm. These are actually not, they're technically not numeric. And they don't turn out to be that valuable, as it turns out. But. The class is not a number. So just, the num just look at the, let's just do the numbers. So we have uh, age, these two, and fair. Let's do those four. Might matter, might not. That's true. That's true. Age and fair do turn out to be good. OK, so those are the numbers. Fair necessarily, but if we can't get the class, that's a ticket. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the numbers. And let's um, train on that. So what I'm going to do is just looking at these four fields and whether they survived or not, let's see how accurate we can be. Who has a guess? For what? The accuracy, so the percent of time that this algorithm predicts survival or not. 85. 85. 75. Okay. Let's give it a go. How big is the data set? Just those four passages? Uh, do I have the size? No, 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 that's just a sample. Oh, okay. uh, let's see, DF shape. It is 891. 
the accuracy is 65% with those four numbers. And how does that sound to you? It's bad. Why is that? What would you compare it to? A random guess. That's a good thing to compare it to. Let's find where I did a random guess. OK, so random guess is here. Random guess gives you 46%. Are you weighing that by the percent of people who did survive? I am not. I am not. So that's just a random guess. But the other thing is to guess the most popular. Now, do you know if more people survived or died on the Titanic? Because I know in the movie, the two stars, the actor died, actor survived. But there were more people than those two on the boat. They mostly died. Mostly died, yeah. The more popular is died, actually. So how about we assume everybody dies? Uh, we get to 57%. So that's one way to baseline. Random, this is the way I always start. Random guess, guess the most popular. So um, using these four numbers, in a sense, we get up to 65% accuracy. OK? All right. Uh, OK. So now let's look at um, ordinal feature. Where's my uh, thing now? Oh, I took it away. OK, now we're going to add the ordinal features. These are any text fields or category fields that have a natural order to them. Do you see any here? Class. Class. Right? So we can assume, and this would be domain knowledge, that perhaps first, uh, from a survival point of view, let's say first is better than second is better than third, or something like that. That's probably correlated in a linear way with the label. OK? Any others? It's not, it's not there, though. Embarked. Embarked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In what order? That's true. I didn't actually try that. I, I, I considered it, we'll see, as a nominal feature. Uh, which can you can you can you can side that way and it'll work out, even if it is ordered. Yep. And then I come back to cabin. It's more of a it's a two D yep. arrangement, like we saw in the visual processing. Yeah, 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 yeah. So if you knew the location, you might be able to turn it into a number. Could be uh, the number of feet from the the side, <laughs> or you know the the number of feet from the top from the deck, or something something like that. A lot of times you do crazy things like that. When I was trying to, I, believe it or not, actually you probably would understand this, uh, I wrote a little machine learning algorithm to predict the price of my condo that I was going to buy when I moved here last year. And so one of the things I looked at was like the distance from the Boston Common, you know, as a, as a number, something like that. How accurate was it? Uh, I, didn't, I didn't end up doing that because I was too lazy. But, um, <laughs> but uh, the algorithm that I wrote was, was actually very helpful. And I know exactly how much I overpaid. OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so let me give you one uh, harder one. This is actually, yeah, let me skip that in the interest of time. So let's, let's add the ordinal feature. So we're going to add. Um, We're going to add, uh, where is it? What do we decide? P class, right? That's numeric. That's on the numbers. OK, that's random. Da, da, da. Ordinal columns, there we go. OK, so now we're going to add the p-class column. And you can see what I did here is I just turned it into a number. There's three, three, da, da, da. OK. So now I am going to train the model again with this new p-class. What do you think I will get? 
Let's stronger. Yeah. How far you guys want to go? Seventy. Actually, I'm not going to write because you're probably wrong. Whatever you say. Let's see. It is. Oh, great! I have to debug in public. Input contains. I wonder why it says that. I probably ran out of order. Run all above. Sometimes this helps. And then run this. Okay, that's better. Uh, that gets you to 68%. Do you know why? Do you know? Do you have a sense for why that didn't improve that much? You have the fare. Okay, so it, if you didn't have fare, this might have made a big difference, right? But sometimes you're adding already correlated features to to your mix. Okay, but you can see. Um, Uh, sometimes, not in this case, but uh, sometimes data collection is a cost to you. So if you were to do some prediction on readmissions or something and you wanted to collect data to drive it, and each additional data point was some other data element some nurse had to type in your system, then you'd really say, do I actually need this piece of data? So a lot of times you do try and reduce the number of features um, for data collection cost reasons. Uh, and then um, correlated features can uh, mess up a model sometimes. So you usually want to just take one of the group. OK. So now um, let's look at are there any other, so are there now nominal category fields that you think would be helpful? Yes. Sex for sure, right? You'd hope so. Women and children first should be on the boat. See if that matters. Uh, anything else? Any others you would try? Cabin number could. It's just there's so many of them. You usually want something that has you know a countable number of answers. So I did this one embarked. Okay. So I did um, sex and embarked, added that to the model. Now, this has no natural order to it, probably. We'll, we'll assume that for this. Um, so there's a different approach that you use to do nominal features. And, uh, and so let me describe this by uh, jumping into another analogy. So. Um, there's, uh, so this is a question about whether a car will get stolen, and it's based on the car's color. Okay, And I don't know whether um, you've heard this uh, myth, but the myth is that red cars get stolen more than any other color. Yeah, yeah. I Googled it, and it doesn't turn out to be true, but it would be helpful if you assume it's true for the next minute. So um, what we do, so here's, here's an example where you, the color red will drive a 1, and non-red seems to drive a 0. Okay? The way to turn this into a number, I'll just give you the answer, is something called one-hot encoding. And the way it works is you basically um, explode the finite number of choices here into separate columns. And the columns you could think of, is the car black? The next column is, is the car red? The next column is, is the car white? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, and it's called one-hot encoding because only one of them will be hot, so to speak, uh, and the rest will be zero. Okay? It makes, it sound, it makes data science sound exciting. <laughs> okay. Um, but anyway, so that's the way it works. And you can see, so what will happen if you fed these columns in as your features from a weights point of view? Remember what I said about weights? So what will be the weight of the one multiplied by this feature? I have a question. Yeah. Um, do you do this for, like, big columns where you have a large number of finite choices? Then aren't you exploding the dimension of your data set? 
You are. So, um, so one thing you need to maybe. So one thing you need to do though is this notion of a of a table, like we're used to of being, I don't know, forty columns wide and a million columns long. Um, just drop that idea, because some of these will be even wider than long. That this exploding the number of columns in SQL terms seems like a horrible idea. But, in, but in, in most of these implementations, columns are like rows. They can, they can have millions of columns. And it's not really going to mess up the algorithm. It's all done with sparse arrays, in a sense. So it's not, it's not going to freak out the underlying infrastructure. In fact, uh, we'll see an example uh, here. Um, but this is, this is one of the advantages of inner systems technology, uh, is that the sparseness concept fits nicely into our database versus other databases. Okay? So this might be something that, um, that you know, we can leverage. And I know Jeff has thought about, uh, thought about that. It's actually something that we have now six customers that have given us some validation that this matters to them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now back on the weights, in a sense. What is going to be the weight for this feature? Going to be two? No, no, no. Is it going to be negative? Zero or positive? It's going to be positive. Color black. Which, which way is it? As in more likely to get stolen? More likely to get stolen. It's going to be zero. So if you assume what I said is true, that red cars get stolen more than the other colors, uh, then these, whether it's black, uh, sorry, this will be maybe slightly negative, but it's, it's um, this one, this one, this one are really not going to matter. But the red is going to matter. This is the weight is going to have a value here. So essentially, red is correlated to whether it's stolen or not. These others, other than the fact that they're not red, are not correlated. So that's how one-hot encoding works. It kind of separates out the different categories, uh, and then the weights can find the right way that each of the values matter to the label. Okay. Yep. In a case like this, where there the other colors, the other colors aren't compared, could we just do a literally a two column of is red? Is not if you knew that, if you knew the answer in advance. Yeah. So if there's something in your domain knowledge, in a right. sense. Th sex, for example. Here. Yeah, yeah. So um, sex is an interesting one because there's only two, well, traditionally there's been two values. Uh, so um, in that case, you can actually drop off one of the, you can, you can make it ordinal. When there's two values, it's, it's kind of a special case. Um, uh, but, but uh, okay. So, um, so now we're going to add the columns for embarked and, uh, and sex, okay? So I'm going to take the three values here, the two values here, and sort of explode it out using this one hot encoding. Okay, and... OK, so this is basically what it looks like, it's sort of just like the slide. Zeros are ones. There's three cities, one, zero, zero. And then you feed this into the algorithm, basically, and you train on this. OK? And what is your guess on the nominal features added in terms of percent accuracy? So we're adding gender and embarking city. 80, 75, 75, look at that, very good. Okay, <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> That's the beauty, you got to be right if you keep saying the same thing your entire life, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, that's, that's about it um, for, uh, for these two, ordinal and, and nominal. It turns out um, that you can get this thing to be a little higher. I have it on slides here. 
if you're curious. So um, uh, these are a few things I won't walk you through, but just so you can see what, what uh, intermediate people like myself can do beyond. So out of the name, I took the title. Uh, family size actually was, was more important than either the separate ones. Uh, and whether you're alone or not uh, ended up being important. So these are kind of derived columns. You can think of it that way. Um, for some reason, uh, binning, they call it. So instead of the raw age, you're putting it in buckets of age and fair helped uh, the process. And then I ran a bunch of, I'm using one model here, but I ran a bunch of different models. And it turns out you can get to 83, actually, to, to, with the Titanic. Yes, Jeff. I'm going to try to channel Google here. Yes. 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 How hard is that? It's not. It's not hard. It, it, it probably wouldn't matter in this case because the number of rows is a thousand or something like that. Uh, so it's not going to figure out Scandinavian names or southern names, things like that. But um, uh, but you can do that, and it basically just explodes out the columns. You know, you consider it one hot encoding. The other thing you can do, this, in this topic of feature engineering, which I gloss over each time I present, um, you could say that may really matter. So you could buy a dictionary of names to nationalities, let's say. You know? And then you could have a derived column of the nationality. Throw that in the model, see if that helps. Things like that. It's like in our patient matching. You know, matching Smith and Smith versus Woodlock and Woodlock you know, a common name versus a rare name, we sort of treat differently. So that's kind of domain, domain knowledge applied. All right, so let us go on to real text. So we've done nominal, we've done ordinal, uh, and now let's dig into how we would deal with, with emails and documents and things like that. So what we're, the way we're going to do this, or the data set we're going to use, is IMDB's data set. And IMDB, does everybody know what this is? This is a movie database. Um, the beauty of this system is, is people put in a text review, and they put in a rating. So you know that this text is positive, or this text is negative. OK? I'm sure some people may make mistakes or be somewhat ambiguous, but essentially you have both text and the label, whether it's positive or negative. So you can use this kind of database to train on what's called sentiment analysis, which is a popular uh, thing that um, uh, we do in machine learning these days, where you read text and you determine whether it's positive or negative. So companies use this, for instance. They do a big press release or some event happens, and they like scan through Twitter and other sort of social media feeds to see whether the sentiment is positive or negative. OK? So we're going to do sentiment analysis on IMDb. OK, so the trick is we need to take this sentence and turn it into a bunch of numbers or a number. OK? So um, how might we do that? So. You could? So that would be, that would be uh, domain knowledge in a sense, or some level of linguistic understanding of the language. So for most of what I'm going to do, this could be Russian. OK, so it's kind of a language neutral approach. But if you knew the language and you're willing to invest in it, you could do things like that. Yes, you can actually, um, uh, I didn't do it in this case, but a lot of these models, after you train them, you can ask for feature importance. And it'll tell you the most positive words and the most negative words, and you could see exactly what you're saying. What about just the length of the text? Length of the text. So you could do some derived columns like that, like the length of the, the text, maybe even the average size of each word or... You know, things like, uh, things like that. Groups of non-alphabetic non characters for things where people create emoticons or just swears in the text that have a 
happen to be somewhat language neutral? Yes. You can uh, consider emoticons as words in, in a lot of these models, uh, for instance, which isn't everything you said, but I picked on the one thing I understood, <laughs> echoed that back. Somebody yeah. with four exclamation <laughs> marks and question mark and pound sign. Sure, that's true. Way. That's true, actually. Um, you'll see uh, in a moment I throw away punctuation, but punctuation, especially these days, can be very, very indicative of, um, of the sentiment. Okay, so the hints, uh, I'll give you two hints on this. One is uh, HBI, which is one of our partners that uses um, uh, our health share data from Health Insight. Uh, they have 113,000 features per patient that they use. So somehow they're taking these text documents and creating a lot of columns. So that's hint number one. Uh, and then it's sort of like one hot encoding. Um, but it's, it's, a long, it's along a similar line. But not related to figuring out the words that, that are <coughs> Correct. Not related to that. Yes? So word that exactly. You could have a column per word, which, again, seems like a crazy idea when you think of SQL terms. But if you don't mind how many columns you have, just have a column per word. And then if they say, let's say one of the columns was Santa, back on my analogy, and they said Santa in the thing, you can imagine how there would be a weight, a negative weight, that makes the presence of the word Santa more childish, in a sense. Or the presence of the word divorce, or 401k, or something like that, more adultish, right? So that's what we will do. One point two million words. I didn't know that. Why do I think there's twenty five thousand words in their language? <laughs> and maybe it's the only only the words I know. Let's see. <laughs> Personal vocabulary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so what I'm, uh, what we're playing with now is fifty thousand movie reviews. Uh, and this data set has just two columns, the review and the sentiment, to start with. So the first we're gonna do, thing we're going to do is just what Elias said, which is the bag of words model. And the way the bag of words model looks is, I'll, I'll just do a small example. Let's say these are your three sentences. This is the columns added for the bag of words model. It takes every word, makes it its own column, uh, and then it counts the number of times that word is used. Okay? And then you train on this, essentially. And you could see how this would work if you think back to the weights and the linear equation that I was talking about, that <laughs> words that don't matter kind of fall off from a weight point of view. Words that matter in an adult way end up getting a positive weight. Words that matter in a child way end up getting a negative weight, that kind of thing. In this case, we're talking about a positive movie review or a negative movie review. Okay? So uh, let's train, shall we? So back to movies. Now I'm going to um, explode this into the bag of words model. Any guess how many columns there will be? Ten to the fourth. A lot of people call that ten thousand. <laughs> ten thousand. All right, we'll do that. Any other uh, exponentially phrased guesses? Fifty thousand. Ted wants to figure it out. One hundred and two thousand. Ten to the fifth for you, Jeff. Yeah, I know you might be lost on the raw, raw numbers. Okay, now we're going to train on this. So, and see, uh, see what we get. We have four, oh, I thought it took 40 seconds. So that was my note. We get an 89% accuracy on just the bag of words model, meaning 89% of the time, and the, the way this is measured is 
I took out 20% of the movie reviews and set them aside. Trained on the 40,000, the bag of words against the sentiment, and then I took that model and tested it on the 10,000. And of the 10,000, 88% of the time, it got it right. So that's whenever I'm giving you the numbers, it's approached like that. Same, 20%. 20%. Okay, so bag of words gives 88%. How's that sound? Yeah, it's pretty good. And how would you know? What would you compare it to? Random guess? Yes, it's right on the board. Very good. Okay, so uh, on random guess, uh, it gets at 50% right. which is predictable, given this data set. Uh, and then uh, what's the most popular movie review? Turns out to be negative. So, um, so if you always guess the movie review is negative, you get to 51%. Okay? So this is pretty good, actually. Okay? So that took every word, threw it in, in there. So, uh, so let me go through a couple... Um, Improvements to this approach. One is that um, I didn't do any cleaning of the text, and this is typically done. So, for instance, lowercase good and uppercase good would be separate columns, and they're, they're not reinforcing each other, essentially. When essentially they mean the same thing. You, could, you might argue they mean the same thing. Maybe all caps has a certain, certain meaning, but, um, but for certain purposes they mean the same same thing. So this actually takes out punctuation, uh, makes everything lowercase. It actually leaves emoticons, uh, replaces them with some um, character representation. Uh, no, it doesn't, does it? Taking the hyphen out of emoticons. You know, this is, I don't know if you guys do this, but this is just like copied from Stack Overflow, like any, like any good engineer. Yep. So God knows what it does, but it's here and it ran. <laughs> Correct. Not yet. Negation is what, what you're referring to. I'll get to that in one second. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so not yet on that point. So, um, so here you can see, uh, you can see it is taking, it's making everything lowercase, taking out the parentheses, um, uh, you know, punctuation, things like that. And this, this helps get the most out of your 50,000 rows, uh, in a sense. Okay. So let's train on this. Any guesses? Eighty-nine. Really? I heard nothing. Eighty-eight. Uh, it is. Um, I think it's eighty-nine. Eighty-nine. Okay. Correct. Correct. Yeah. It just. It. 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 It makes, like the good and good case, it makes the data go a little bit farther. Um, okay, so let's talk about, um, actually, I'm actually going to run this because it takes a little bit of time. Uh, let's talk about negation. So uh, if I say this movie is, was good, and if I say this movie was not good, what would the bag of words model do with that? Yeah, I mean, it would pick up on the word not as an individual word. This was not good, it was bad, and this was not bad. Correct. Yeah, yeah. So the word not is a particularly tricky one for, for machine learning, or the, the whole negation concept where it almost sounds like you're making a point, but you're making the exact opposite point with you know, a, a small three-letter word. So um, there are different ways to deal with it, but one of the more popular ways uh, in with these algorithms, is something called the n-gram. Uh, and what it does is it groups every two words together instead of every one word. So you could think of, actually, I think I have slides. No, I guess, no, I don't. Um, I thought I showed it. But if you do every two, two words, then um, it's basically grouping, you know, you can imagine, 
the sun is shining would be the sun, sun is, is shining. So it basically does the two grouping. That doesn't cover every style of negation. You know, this is not really that good kind of thing. Um, but you could do things like the presence of the word not in a sentence or things like uh, that. But an easy thing to do, it only takes me a second to pass another argument to these things, is just add the two grams. Now, it has implications. So you can see now the number of columns has gone to 2.5 million. Okay, so it really exploded this, uh, this thing out. Um, but it helps. You can see it got to 91% accuracy. Okay, so, um, so again, this, 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 column, this lots of columns thing is kind of freaky to like an ordinary database thinking. But, but again, these, thing, they, these things don't mind. This is a 50,000 row table. 2.5 million columns, no problem. You know, the algorithms take these things as matrix of any, of any size. Okay, um, let me cover two other methods. The first is, um, so what words uh, end up dominating the, the model's work? Frequent words. Actually, the, the least important words. You know? The model is chewing on and the, you know, is, you know, words like this that are frequently used that you know are not differentiating. Right? So a popular method to deal with that is, uh, if you, if, first of all, if you want to dig into the language itself, you can take them out. There are dictionaries of what's called stop words and you could just remove the stop words. But if you're not, um, if you don't want to dive into the language itself, the most popular approach is something called TFIDF. Um, and it basically normalizes this. So you count the number of times a word is used, and you divide it by the number of documents that uses that word. And you do a few extra things. Um, uh, to it, some oversimplifying, but you're sort of normalizing whether this document uses that word in an extraordinary way. So, um, so here is that method applied to these sentences. So let's just read the sentence. The sun is shining. What are the two most important words in this sentence? Sun and shining. So in this method, um, you can see they end up with the two highest values. Uh, in this one, weather is sweet. Uh, you have uh, sweet and weather. So they, they end up having the two highest values. Uh, this is the tiniest data set, uh, and it repeats itself, so it's, it's not perfect. But essentially, words that are different than, than other reviews that stand out end up being more prominent in the model process. Okay, so this is kind of a way to automatically de-weight um, words that are, are used everywhere and essentially don't end up mattering. Yep. But would this also de-weight something like good and bad? It would. It would. It would. Yeah, yeah. It, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't remove the word. It just, the model has an easier time with it. Uh, if you if you take frequent words and sort of lower lower them down, essentially. Okay, so, uh, so let's see if that helps. T F I D F. Oh, that was that one. I'm going back to one gram uh, stuff because. Okay, so um, any guess on the accuracy on this one? Same. It is, oh, it's, it's actually, I'm only using one gram for this. I think it's 89. 90. Very good. 
Okay. And the one other thing I thought I should explain is the way I know works. So I know is our technology. Um, and what it does is it groups, um, it basically groups <coughs> concepts together and relationships together. Uh, and the way you can do that prior to feeding a machine learning model, uh, this I had uh, Benjamin Debeau did, did this, who's on the, on the phone, um, is basically what he did is he took the words, he left the one grams in there, um, but basically when there was a concept, he took the words together and put an underline between them. So essentially that ends up being treated as one word. So off because seeing, for some reason, off because seeing was seen as a concept, first movie, which makes sense, is seen as a concept. So it was brought together by sort of grouping them under, uh, with this underlying approach. And so if you um, use that, any guess on accuracy? I think it actually doesn't help. I think it's about the same as the rest of these. I'm going to write 89 because that's, that's my recollection, but we'll see. Okay, we'll come back to this. It takes 50 seconds. Oh, there's... So it's 1.1 million columns. So that's basically the way it's expanded. So it's not as, as much... So there's, there's some NLP in here that sort of knows the language and knows these concepts are related. Um, so it's smarter than 2-gram, you know, because it's grouping things in an intelligent, uh, intelligent way. Uh, 89 is what it comes out to. So basically once... And this is, this is typical, you know, that you think more advanced methods give you better accuracy, but, but once you'll find that depending on the data set, they sort of come in the same range, okay? So, um, so that's basically how, um, how text works. I'll show you one more thing, and then we'll, uh, we'll close. But generally speaking, do you understand the concept? So you're basically taking the words, exploding that out into columns, you're counting them or normalizing by the times they're used, and then you could just feed into the algorithms that we talked about uh, last time. Okay, the last thing I wanted to show you was a concept of continuous learning. Uh, what I've done is um, now the model is running, and I have a little web server that is reading that model. So who wants to give a movie review? Ariel? Sorry? The first. The sound mixing was a little off. <laughs> but you gotta impress you gotta be impressed by someone who sings with a broken leg. Be impressed. <laughs> Six out of ten. One who sings with a broken leg. Now, do you think that's going to be positive or negative? I think it's mostly positive. It is positive. Very good. Okay. So, um, so we could do another one. This movie was very good. Positive. So now... Um, Probably 62%. I don't know why I didn't get higher. The, the interesting thing about, um, about this that I wanted to point out is there's a correct and an incorrect button here. Okay? So, um, so if I... There was some statement that wasn't... It was a little nebulous. I, I think it was, I haven't made up my mind on this movie, which I'll, which I'll consider negative. Oh, it did consider it negative. What was my exact sentence? I haven't really made up my mind on this one. Let me type that in. I haven't really made up my mind on this one. And that comes out as positive. So now you see I'm going to mark it incorrect. I'm going to type it in again. Let me get that in my clipboard. So it's positive to a lesser extent. 
don't know if you remember the probability. I'm going to say incorrect. Now it's positive to a lesser extent, incorrect. Now it comes out as negative. So this is an example of you've got a model, but you interact with the user, and you figure out whether they agree with it or not, and you train the model continuously. OK? So this is an important part of machine learning. So let's say, let me give an example. You're using Amazon. The trick on this is to get feedback from the user in a way that's not so explicit. So you're using Amazon. It's showing you ads using machine learning to determine what ads are relevant to you. How does it know whether you agree or not agree with what it decided? Say again? Yeah, whether you click on the ad or not. OK? So they take that click, and they feed that back into the training process. So for instance, in our patient matching, where Leah is looking at uh, putting machine learning in there, when they say this is a match or not a match, that's a learning opportunity from a machine learning point of view. Or if we someday put an algorithm in HealthShare to determine which patients are eligible for a clinical trial, and they say yes or no, that's a learning opportunity. So essentially what we'll find ourselves doing is putting, thinking through the feedback cycle in our user experience, and then taking that and driving that into a continuous learning process. Because that's what we need to learn from, is the humans using our system. They're the ones that are sort of generating training data. And in our user experience, we need to sort of capture that, that um, you know, agreement or disagreement process. And there's a variety of you know, ways, to, ways to do that. All right. I am at time. I hope this was useful. And I um, guess that's it. Thanks, everyone.